we launched Miss Mojo, and and to some extent, rightfully, there was a little bit of pushback. I mean, obviously, now you know, hearing about cancel culture, sure, the internet always finds, uh, you know, a way to offend some people. But when we launched Miss Mojo, we did have some pushback, and people said, "Why are you gendering? Why are you assuming this and that?" And you know, I have two daughters, and we kind of explained then that it would actually you know, wasn't inconsistent for media to, um, you know, want to better serve certain segments, think of Mademoiselle or Elle magazine. But ultimately, it was a, it was it was a positive thing, because we wanted to create a safe environment where our fans could watch videos in a more positive area. You know, if you if you build up a fan base and a community where they're used to watching top 10 Metallica songs, if all of a sudden you publish top 10 One Direction songs, um, you know, the community is not going to necessarily embrace that as much. So we just wanted to serve more, more people. And I think we felt kind of vindicated because over time, the small has become one of the most positive uh, communities on YouTube. And in fact, it's, it's, it's something we're very proud of. And, and so are the fans. So that just speaks more about just to kind of sometimes sticking to your gut, your own convictions and kind of blocking out the noise uh, because it's impossible to please everybody, especially on the internet. I think you hit the nail on the head, though, in terms of, of what you're trying to do in terms of servicing people and servicing a marketplace versus pandering to social pressures and or looking a particular PC way or trying to do things a way that you think might sort of garner you additional revenue or, or advertising or whatever in terms of of being an entrepreneur and what kind of leads me into my, my first question, but, but being an entrepreneur, being a business owner in general, you are there to fill a need, a product or service or whatever that is. And, and, you know, I, I was watching your documentary um, right before this Fox in the hen house, uh, how capitalism can redeem us. And if any, if you guys get the chance, go check it out on YouTube after this, um, Jessica can probably find a link to it. Um, but, but you were talking about a story um, of yourself when you were a kid and you found your dad's business card and it said entrepreneur on it or entrepreneurship on it and, and you didn't know what that me meant essentially. And, and what has it been now, 30, 40, 50 years later, can you tell us looking back what is an, an entrepreneur to you? What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? And, and what makes someone a good entrepreneur, um, if you will? Sure. So a lot of questions there, all good ones. So ultimately, an entrepreneur is someone who takes the time, the energy, the resources, the capital to mobilize a group of people for a common cause. I think at the root of entrepreneurship is that risk taking that you are ultimately putting your neck out on the line. You are foregoing, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, opportunity costs to chase something that frankly, most people will not understand. And that's actually part of the game, right? Um, being Canadian, I have to reference Wayne Gretzky. It's not about where the puck is now. It's about where the puck is going, so to speak. So when, when you start off as an entrepreneur, you know, you want to, you actually want to be a bit of a contrarian. You actually want people to scratch their head. You know, when people sometimes say, yeah, good luck with that business, buddy, um, early on, it's, it's, it's normal. And you have to have a very thick skin. I think in the last 20 years, entrepreneurship has changed in perception. It's no longer fringe. Kids don't grow up saying, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer to please mom or dad. They don't even want to be a hedge fund manager or private equity venture capitalist because that's where the money is so to speak many of them look up to mark zuckerberg elon musk many others um, and they say hey i want to grow up and i want to be an entrepreneur now there is a difference fundamentally between being entrepreneurial uh, and being an entrepreneur so at the root of it being an entrepreneur you do have to risk your own money you have to risk your own you know capital so to speak so so to me it was never about money uh, I've never been driven by money. Um, that's the paradox that I ended up having the good fortune of, of you know, generating uh, money. But it was because, like, I always think of, like, Google. Google early on gave away traffic, and then it got more traffic. You know, it shared revenue. By no means Google is not perfect, but it shared revenue with publishers, and then it made a lot more revenue. 
So I think fundamentally, given my nature and my nurture, um, it was always about, yeah, like you said, the word serve, here to serve. That's ultimately my statement of you know, purpose. Like that's what I like to do, whether it's serving food for guests, serving people drinks, making sure people are happy, the elimination of their discomfort and pain. That's not taught for better or worse. That's, that's you know, even though I grew up in Montreal and uh, Western as they come, and I, I joke that I'm as, I'm as Muslim as a BLT, but I do recognize that being born in Iran in 1978, uh, there is something in my DNA, which is very much about giving and then creating value for others. And then, hey, maybe you'll get something over time. And that's really been the secret of my success with all stakeholders, employees, community, viewers, clients. If there's a message I actually want to give people, you know, this is our 15th, 16th year of business. It's technically a new decade because 2020 was a blur. Uh, I'm 43 as of last week, so in this new kind of my 40s, I want to tell people that, that if you really want to actually achieve peak success, however you define success, whether it's money, fame, power, whatever, you know, works for you, you will get it by actually kind of giving and, and by thinking that way, instead of always thinking, what's in this for me? Um, it takes a little bit of patience. It takes a lot of persistence, but it absolutely, uh, I'm proof of it. It does work, but it is the, the path least taken. And that's ultimately the story of entrepreneurship. Wow. You, you said some really powerful stuff there, especially, you know, kind of really laying out the difference between being a servicer, someone who gives back and creates value, creates wealth, um, um, as opposed to someone who just takes and is all me, me, me. And you're going to be very stunted as a business person um, moving forward if you're always constantly looking out, you know, what's in it for myself without looking at the, the greater whole or the bigger picture and, and how I can, um, you know, kind of fundamentally expand the pie and, and create value for my customers or create value for society. Um, I, I want to ask you, you, you talked about in your video at first being an intrapreneur, uh, someone maybe with entrepreneurship skills, but, but, but worked at a company or worked within a larger company. And, and what sort of made you make the switch from being an entrepreneur, someone who has entrepreneurship background, but works for a company to, to want to hang out your own shingle, to want to become a full entrepreneur. Um, what happened uh, that made you want to make that leap? Great question. So I, it would be disingenuous for me to sit here and say, well, why isn't everybody an entrepreneur? Why doesn't everybody take that leap of faith? Well, here's reality. It's just that it's hard. It's being an entrepreneur is a privilege. Um, if you are a single mother working a couple of jobs, well, guess what? You might have the greatest idea ever. It's hard for you to even just process and just think about taking your concept and turning it into reality. So, you know, I, I consider myself, you know, I, I, there's many shoulders that I've stood on. It's not, I mean, am I a self-made person or not? It's all relative in some ways, absolutely. In many ways, no. So, I had a great life, you know, like good education, relatively speaking, good upbringing. You know, I, I, you know, I am not a man of many wants. My needs were met, so to speak. But I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur, partly because I sold myself short. I was like, oh, I'm not responsible enough. I'm not serious enough. I'm a party too much. You know, it's, I can maybe, you know, maybe I'm not that good of a leader when in fact I had all those skills and I had all those traits. I just kind of wasn't maybe mature enough to realize. But fundamentally, once I got into the startup world and once I got into uh, organizations that were small enough where my impact could actually not just be felt and measured, but it was pretty clear that I was creating a lot of value. In the back of my mind, I never once had envy. I write a lot. If you guys are interested in this thinking, you could check out contextisking.com, which is where you could also find the documentary Context TV. That's the whole new brand that talks about life, entrepreneurship, work-life play balance. It's under the kind of mojo house of brand, so to speak, but it's a, purposely a different brand. And I always talk about the sins and the virtues, right? So it's always life about balancing good and evil. It's very easy to turn dark. It's very easy to 
kind of go in a very negative and evil place. You actually have to fight that. And, and when people kind of are unjust to you or when bad things happen. But all to say, for me, I was never greedy. It was never like envy of like my colleagues who had more. But I did get to a point where on a very practical meat and potato sense, I was like, look, I'm clearly creating a lot of value. I want to be able to dictate where to shift and allocate resources to create jobs and to pursue opportunities. And there was a little bit of friction, nothing disrespectful, but there was friction between myself and my old colleagues where I was like a minority you know, partner, but driving a lot of value. But aside from the whole decision of like, well, well where, should we, um, where should we allocate resources? I, I fundamentally just wanted to quote Herb Kelleher, the legendary founder of Southwest Airlines. I wanted to treat people the way I wanted to be treated. In fact, better. I wanted to treat clients a certain way. I wanted to treat my employees a certain way. I wanted to treat the community a certain way. And I realized like it just was clear to me that unless you were ultimately the person who has the privilege to make the last decision and who gets to, when nobody's watching, help shape culture, which is really a function of how you communicate, I had to be the CEO, the president, whatever you want to call it. And nobody was going to go out there and give Ashkan Karbis Rushan in a post 9-11 world, you know, that I joked, like people thought maybe are you the 20th hijacker? And you obviously use humor to kind of deal with whatever insecurities that, that, that kind of like drive you. Um, but I kind of was like, look, I will only be in a position where I could do all these things if I'm the person ultimately who uh, you know, gets to set the culture. And I just realized I had to start a business. So I was the reluctant entrepreneur who had been effectively an intrapreneur, creating a lot of new products, driving a lot of new uh, initiatives at other companies. So for me, it was never about the money. And in fact, I kind of said, I, I used to have money after being a successful executive. And then I kind of poured it all into Watch Mojo. But so for me, it was really all about being able to walk to the beat of my own drum. And it was to stick to my principles and stick to my convictions. And frankly, 15, 16 years ago, when I started Watch Mojo and I would have conversations with venture capitalists, we would talk about a lot of stuff where we were, you know, the, the, the merits of investing in a content business. You know, we had a lot of conversations about strategy, tactics, and whatnot. But, but I used to say that, look, I go, I fundamentally believe that culture could be a competitive advantage the same way that having a positive uh, outlook is the difference sometimes between a team coming back and, and you know, winning after being down 4-1 versus being down 4-1 and then being blown out 9-1 because you have to stay positive. And when I would say that kind of thing about culture could be a competitive advantage, VCs would roll their eyes. It was like, Ash, like, shut up. Just show me the money. We don't care about this mumbo jumbo that you're talking about. If you fast forward now to the late 2010s, you see billionaires like Ray Dalio, Jamie Dimon, everybody's saying, hey, you know what? Capitalism needs to be more just. It needs to be more fair. You start talking about whether it's progressive capitalism, inclusive capitalism, whatever you call it, semantics. It's the same thing. And there's basically a handful of pillars, which have been basically how I've run my life. One is fundamentally, uh, you talked about it, it's, it's, it's kind of like purpose. You, know, you need to have a purpose that goes beyond profit. And for me, it's been, again, here to serve. The second one is this kind of stakeholder mindset where it's not just about shareholders, it's always about the greater good. Um, the third one is just basically having a, a caring and compassionate leadership style, which is really easy to do in boom times. But, you know, like I basically mortgaged my house instead of letting go a single person when, when time was rough. I didn't pay myself for six years. Um, and obviously your team early on sees that and appreciates that. The people I've hired in the last five years could care less and they should care. It's not, it doesn't concern them what I did 15 years ago, right? You also have to be realistic. Um, the other one is just the focus on culture. And, and people talk about culture and cultures go beyond hashtags. They go beyond a lot of things that are superficial. Um, it's really about every play, right? Like if you ever have played football, you don't win football because you throw a Hail Mary. You throw football because for an hour, you are basically blocking and tackling and doing the, the right things, but you also are exerting 
the discipline to not make stupid mistakes. I would add, by the way, a, a fifth point on this whole you know, better version of capitalism, which is actually independence and self-sustainability. I went to bed for six years, every night dreading payroll. It was like, hey man, if there's a US post strike and those checks don't come in from clients, maybe I can't make payroll. And once we broke even, I just made a decision to never want to find myself in that situation. And, you know, like I, I personally think that the, a big mistake that many people make is that they expect there to be this like miraculous white knight who emerges at the 11th hour to save you. And so one of the advice I give people is, is be careful of that, you know, that saying that like, you know, people will sometimes give you an umbrella when it's sunny, but then the second they see a cloud, let alone rain, they'll ask for it back, right? So I feel kind of a sense of vindication, but not at all about like the revenues and the profits and the subscribers, but just that I go, wow, what I wanted to create, which meant it wasn't going to be the biggest business, but as I said earlier, ideally, hopefully the most admired or respected business, I was like, that can be done. It took some time. So a little bit of validation and vindication when I see all these people now that used to roll their eyes kind of come around and kind of pursue the same thing. So why YouTube? Why, why media, why storytelling, and or how do you go about finding your purpose or finding how you create value into the world? And, and maybe you can touch upon how Watch Mojo, the, the launch of that or the, the challenges in, or how you chose to make a media brand or make a YouTube channel. H how did you find your purpose? Sure. So, I mean, if you think of like, you know, statement of purpose here to serve, vision, inform and entertain. I've always been very much driven around knowledge and, you know, history, social sciences, humanities. I, I do fundamentally think that, you know, if, if, if I've had any success and success is relative, but if I've had any success, it's because of my interests early on in history, psychology, sociology, anthropology, et cetera, et cetera, even philosophy, all of that. Um, but so early on, so vision is like the, the why, the thing that never changes, the constant. And for us, that was inform and entertain. But then your mission is the what, it's the how do you accomplish? And that should change. So when we started, um, for me, it was, I wanted to have a video on every topic. Why? Mankind is differentiated from animals because of our ability to tell stories. That ability to tell stories is a force of good. It brings people together, but it's also a very destructive tool if you think of like World War II and Hitler and Germany, right? Propaganda and all that. That's ultimately storytelling used for bad. And so for me, I just felt ultimately that if the world had already kind of gone through, you know, the computer revolution, the internet, uh, World Wide Web, uh, mobile, we were basically going towards this 247 connectivity where over time, everything was going to be available in the palm of your hand in, on this device. And so I would, don't want to lie. If I came here and said, oh, in 2005, I launched Watch Mojo and I found out that this website, YouTube, is also registered, and I just said I'm going to build a, an empire on YouTube, I'd be a liar. That's not actually what happened. What happened was I could see that as much as people were, were you know, what had happened was you had the, the, the search engine revolution, which kind of changed the way people found content, the way they discover or recover content. Second, you did have the rise of social with initially Friendster, MySpace, and then Facebook. Third, you had the rise of these video platforms that were a bit of a game changer. You know, the concept of like YouTube and Netflix today, but before it, you know, you had Gooba and Rever, and before that you had Pop.com that Steven Spielberg wanted to get off the ground. It was, it was clear that it was like, I can produce tomatoes and expect people to come to my farm, my website, but for me to sell more tomatoes, I have to go to the marketplace, YouTube. So when, when I launched Watch Mojo, I won't lie. I was like, it would be great if people come to watchmojo.com, but I knew I had to go where the audience was and increasingly it was YouTube. And then finally, obviously mobile, which just meant people were gonna always be searching for information, information that historically they found in public forums where they gathered around fires and told stories. And then over time, 
through things like print, whether it was newspapers or magazines, and then the radio, and then television, and then you had cable that disrupted. But the, if you looked at all the trends and put them in a nice martini shaker, the cocktail that came out had to be shorter content, edited much faster. A story about, say, World War II was not going to be 22 minutes or 48 minutes. It had to be three, four, five minutes. And you couldn't just do the whole war in one two-hour video. You actually had to make it atomic, not molecular. You had to basically break down who was Hitler, you know, the Third Reich. Uh, you know, the siege of the battle of Stalingrad, you really had to kind of like go more niche because that's the way people were searching for content. And so as I started to produce a video on every topic, eventually our mission changed. Then it was like, okay, I was like, we've covered a lot of like the top, let's call it 2000 topics. And there's a long tail. If you covered the top 2000 topics in videos, there's a lot you haven't covered, but you've actually covered quite a bit. But then once we started to kind of serve our audience, I was like, you know, people, when they search for a fondue recipe, it's in and out. And frankly, we're not going to compete with that grandma in Switzerland who's been making fondue all of her life. And because technology is getting better, they will be able to produce videos that are going to look like the quality that you see on the cooking channel. So I was like, it doesn't make sense for us to compete there. For us, <clears throat> In 2012, that's when six years in, <clears throat> we made four big bets. One, I said, we can't be everything to everyone. Let's focus on what we're more passionate about, but also what we are probably have a shot to be really number one in, which is let's just cover entertainment and pop culture. Why? Because two, I felt that geek culture was going to overtake pop culture. What does that mean? That means that kids who were basically reading comic books were now adults and they were working on Madison Avenue, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and Wall Street. And they would basically pull in these stories that they had grown up with, Batman, Spider-Man, et cetera, into their everyday life. Three, I felt that like, well, look, we're not gonna be able to do 27 different formats. We gotta nail one. And the way that like venture capitalists talk about product market fit, I was like, if you're in the storytelling business, you got to find platform format fit. ESPN was basically a cable channel. Uh, Howard Stern, shock talk radio. Uh, PewDiePie, let's play gamer. Watch Mojo, I said, we're going to do top tens because that's our format. At that moment, nobody was doing them. Um, you know, if you think of Letterman, Wayne's World, Moses and his Ten Commandments, it was a format that mankind has always been drawn to. And then last but not least, I said, we got to go where the fish are. And that was YouTube. It was clear. The industry viewed YouTube as a pariah because they were looking at it through their own eyes. I was looking at it through the eyes of the viewers. And I was like, YouTube is by far the collection of video content, bar none. That's where the audience is going to go. As much as I may want people to come to watchmojo.com, they're going to go there. So once we kind of narrowed and really focused, and I won't lie, and this might be more interesting uh, given that this is a, a, you know, an entertainment forum. We had relationships with rights holders because early on we would interview Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber. We would interview the developers of Ubisoft. We would interview directors of movies. And rights holders were essentially supporting us and saying, look, if you guys want to create these videos and you want to use some clips from our catalog, that's fine. And me trying to always be ethical, well, I would go to them and say, okay, that's great. Could we sign some kind of master agreement that says you give us permission to do this? And they're like, we're not going to waste our time because this is not really revenue generating. If you're doing that, you're, you're basically protected under fair use, it's editorial. And so even though I'm not a lawyer, I started to kind of dive in more and more around copyright and fair use exceptions. And I realized that because most people were not lazy, but for lack of a better word, would never go beneath the surface. Most people would just kind of assume, well, look, if you're trying to build a commercial enterprise, you can't rely on fair use. But I was like, well, that's not really what the law says. The law says a number of things. You have to bring them all together. But I said, ultimately, if the purpose of copyright is to pr promote the arts and sciences, and it's not actually to protect IP, that's not the purpose of copyright. It's to promote arts and sciences. I said, well, fair use through parody, criticism, commentary, mashups, 
also promotes the arts and sciences. And so because we were comfortable to go where others were maybe not comfortable to go, our videos just stood out in the early 2000s. If you search for Beyonce, we had Beyonce's biography featuring her clips, short excerpts, but nonetheless, if eventually you search for Seinfeld, we had the top 10 Seinfeld moments. So our videos on YouTube, which was really a, a collection largely of either pirated content or a lot of talking head content, our videos just stood out, right? And so we <clears throat> always knew that YouTube was head and shoulders above everybody else, but it was frankly pattern recognition. You know, you talked about some of the parts. So there's like Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology is two things. One is just that the sum uh, of the parts are greater than the individual components, but Gestalt is also <clears throat> just recognizing a pattern, right? It's kind of, you have all these kind of bullet points and you're like, hey, wait, I see something. So for me, it was pretty clear <clears throat> that if we basically make those big bets, we would likely be successful. And we were, uh, it just took a while to, to find that path, but it basically meant that writing the YouTube rocket ship, Watch Mojo went on to become one of like the, the better known media brands uh, in, in consumer media of this, uh, of this century. The, the, the three takeaways that I really got from that are passion, figure out what you're good at, and, and I guess maybe four things, forecast for the future and, and find that tried or true format. I guess that's part of being good. So, so forecast for the future, have passion, and be tried, be good at something tried and true that you can make money off of. True. And that, was, I was just going to say, with that being said, why is it and how is it that Watch Mojo is so successful uh, and, and Quibi just failed spectacularly? And okay. so, so that's a great, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you're comparing apples to oranges, but, but it's actually. The, the answer lies in that. So for one, one of the best sayings is, you know, you can't take nine women and put them in a room and say, let's have a baby in a month, right? So that I believe is a Warren Buffett quote. I've kind of tweaked that into saying, you know, what generally scales quickly, what scales overnight is not sustainable. And what is sustainable cannot scale overnight. It takes time. It's like cooking. You need time for the ingredients to come together. So we took our time. I thought we were late. We were kind of early. So we took our time. And frankly, because of the lack of capital we had, I had to always be creative. And I always had to come up with solutions that were sustainable. When you have access to unlimited capital, like someone like Jeffrey Katzenberg would, it's very easy to conflate money for solution. So Quibi, I feel, made a number of structural, strategic, but tactical kind of mistakes, and some of it in hindsight. I had breakfast with Jeffrey Katzenberg, like humble brag, and he, when he explained Quibi to me before it launched, I did think it was like a brilliant kind of ambitious, as he says, between the improbable and the impossible, because he basically presented it more as, we now watch so much content on mobile devices, sometimes out in public, that the way that movies and TV shows that storytelling has been shot is outdated. So to me that resonated because I was recreating shows you would find on the Discovery Channel or you know, VH1 for a new media platform. So to me, what he was trying to accomplish at first resonated. He then went on his merry way raised a couple billion dollars. The mistake he made is that he basically said, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give a ton of money to establish talent that maybe Variety Magazine is gonna care about, but I'm not so sure, and I say this very humbly, I'm not so sure if the average viewer cared about. So there was a bit of a disconnect between okay, is Reese Witherspoon the kind of talent that would make a young user who is shaping their consumer behavior for the rest of their life, is that going to resonate with them? So it's not so much a lack of platform format, but there was a, some kind of disconnect there. That's one. 
Two, and there's a lot of other things. Two, I feel like the biggest advantage that Quibi had with the creative community was that it said, you get to keep the IP. It's yours. We're just going to license it for you for a period of time. That is brilliant. But if you're already giving the talent TV-like budgets, you actually don't need to do that. So I kind of feel like when the going got rough, and it does with all startups, Quibi had the floor taken off from under it, essentially, because of the second thing. And so it goes back to, as a student of history, as a student of business history, all successful companies on the internet are eventually successful through iteration. There's very, very few cases where money is the strategy. And with Quibi, it was money as a strategy. There was no, hey, let's take our time to develop a product and iterate and find that platform format product market fit. It was, we're going to be successful because of the past track record. And as they say in finance, past performance does not guarantee future performance. That, that, that's awesome. Um, I, I want to kind of turn the subject just a little bit now to getting a job, um, getting hired, finding, you know, that entry level step, maybe if you're not ready to become an entrepreneur, what is something that you look for um, when considering to hire someone? What is something that impresses you in a potential candidate and or where should new students, sorry, new graduates, recent graduates be looking in terms of the job market for future growth? Okay, so let's start with the last question. A mistake that a lot of students make is they say, hey, I studied marketing. Ergo, I will go get a job in marketing. No, that's like mistake number one. You just wasted five years of your life. In 2021 in particular, you have to start off with what is something that you have to kind of paraphrase Plato's principle of specialization and comparative advantage? What is that one thing that you have historically throughout your life been better at, more knowledgeable at, uh, at, that you kind of lap the competition, so to speak. Let's use something that seems a bit basic, not in a bad way, but I mean, not technically complicated. Let's say you grew up as a stamp collector. You're passionate about stamps. You would eat stamps if you could, right? You're a collector, you know them all, the history, how to value them. If you get a marketing degree, your school education is just a tool. It's a tool, it's a tonic to activate your knowledge and your comparative advantage in stamps. Because you could go get a job at Procter & Gamble, and you probably should at first just to gain experience. I'm not knocking Procter & Gamble. But if you were the best stamp aficionado by year four or five, you're going to say, what am I doing here selling soap? I want to go do something with stamps, okay? So one is, what is your comparative advantage? Now, I did not say passion. We're going to get to passion in a second. So for one is, you don't need to know it. It may be subconscious. It may be too obvious, not obvious enough. You got to figure out that. That is your, that's your foundation. Two, it's as I alluded, two is whatever you study, whatever training you get, is a means to an end, it's a catalyst to what sets you apart. Three, I like to think that demand and supply is undefeated. I would love to be a journalist. Whenever I see jobs lost in media, I feel bad. I don't like to see anybody lose their jobs. But people need to understand, it's like that writer who wrote about baseball for SI, that job makes no sense. Why? way too many people are willing to write about the Boston Red Sox for free. Some of it is not good. Much of it is good enough. And a lot of it is as good as that SI guy who maybe just got the job through nepotism, contact, relationship, serendipity, or hard work and, and, and merit. But if there's a million people who are now willing to do that job for free, that guy's going to be out of a job. I'm not passing judgment. It's an economic statement. 
the other one is is this something whereby i will be able to make money will somebody pay me passion is important if you're not passionate about what you do somebody else is going to beat you to the puck somebody is going to do it for a dollar cheaper somebody is going to do it faster better so passion is then kind of like a wild card intangible but i fundamentally believe it starts with comparative advantage demand and supply dynamics etc cetera, etc cetera. now to your previous point what do i look for well look a mistake that i've made repeatedly is i always think oh this person reminds me of myself in this way or this person is that way it's not the point i'm making is not that i think oh people are like me meaning they're better at my weaknesses or they have my strengths and they could be a stronger version of me it's not that it's that i oftentimes project too much onto people i assume people may have a certain amount of drive a certain amount of know how a certain amount of principles a certain amount of maybe integrity <clears throat> or a desire to do a given job so what i look for is more now more and more to actually i shut my mouth i ask a question and i let people kind of really show me that what i see in them they can deliver they don't need to see it in themselves yet because they're young they're an experience i'm here to build their confidence i'm here to build them into the best version of themselves and the fact that 15 years later i have the same four co-founders and 10 of the core 10 employees have been with us for over 10 years which is kind of unheard of is is a validation of that but so what i ultimately look for in people is more honesty integrity character and frankly intellectual honesty because life is too short and what i realize is if somebody ultimately doesn't have a skill you could teach them that if somebody doesn't know a language whether it's a spoken language or a programming language they can learn that but if somebody as i said earlier cannot control their emotions and is always giving into darkness and evil and i know some people are rolling their eyes going what class are we in that basically means cheating dishonesty you know not doing the right thing and then it creates other problems for you that you cannot teach so what i really look for in people is that capacity that candor that 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 kind of like you know thing that you cannot teach somebody which is ultimately character principle and integrity because everything else especially when you work in new media especially when you work in technology everything else is teachable everything else is going to change anyway but you can never take somebody that lacks any principles and instill it in them You hear that guys so pay attention in ethics class. It's true. It's true. Look, all of the clichés are true. It takes you decades to, you know, build up your reputation and I'm human. Sometimes I'm I'm going to rush because I'm here to serve, want to get an answer to somebody quickly and you know, I may jump the gun uh, the gun and and get quickly and make a mistake and I have no problem saying I'm sorry, thank you, you're welcome. But I see people have a hard time saying that, right? So what I want is people that for the greater good understand that maybe you were wrong how do you react are you do you have such a mental block in in apologizing when you're wrong well if you do the company's communication will be pretty bad and then the culture would be pretty bad so you know 15 years ago i probably wasn't this vocal about this stuff because people thought like ash is a hippie and who's this guy But what I realize is like those insecurities that I go hey it's true I never cared about money and I never cared about power not that I have any power per se but I never cared about like fame and those things but I didn't want to be the guy that people said hey you want to resolve a problem go talk to Ash Ash will solve Ash will at least come up with a solution that when people are having a conflict will bring the parties together right and that's ultimately what you're doing you're constantly resolving a conflict between two employees a client and a salesperson your lawyer and somebody else's lawyer and you know i i kind of have always gotten more of a kick to be that kind of king solomon kind of character that 
although I'm sure suggesting to cut a baby in two will get you canceled these days. But the point is, I've always kind of been more drawn to that. And business and entrepreneurship were a means to an end. I never woke up saying, I want to be in business to make money. I was like, you know what? I feel like I could have a lot of impact by going into business and specifically entrepreneurship. Wow. I, um, I, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but, but the last question that I have, and I'll turn it over to everyone else, can you just maybe share what the best little wisdom of business advice you've received as in your life? Have you ever been given a good piece of wisdom? I get, look, the best teach, not that I'm a teacher, but the best teachers are perpetual students. I get five tips and lessons a day at 550. So it's hard. Maybe I should do a top 10. There's a few that come out, right? I remember uh, Rich Antonelli, founder of Complex. I was just talking, I talked to him a lot. He's a, he's a good industry friend. Um, like years ago, he said something and it just shook me. It was like foundations, like an earthquake. And he just basically said, he meant it just, he was like, Ash, you, of course, are always very honest. He's like, don't forget, most people are not like that. It wasn't that, oh, most people are not honest. It was that we project a lot onto people, onto situations. And then I think that creates a lot of confusion. That creates also a lot of uh, a lack of alignment. So, I, you know, it's like that saying, people are basically telling you what they're like and what they're gonna do, but you sometimes don't wanna see it. You don't wanna hear it. You don't wanna believe it. The main advice that I would give people is do not assume that others have your sensitivities, your worldview, your beliefs. That is probably, I think, going to save everybody who's listening a lot of heartbreak a lot of heartburn, a lot of disagreements. That's one. The other thing that I would say, and I've already said the whole thing about giving to get maybe over time, which, is, which has served me well. Um, the other thing that I will, will fundamentally say is, um, it is true that we talk a lot about people and we talk a lot about, um, and this is actually a bit harsh, but it's probably more realistic. You know, the way that you have the 80-20 rule, I also believe you have like the 110-89 rule. 1% are going to be the super driven, super ambitious, super go-getter, whether they're entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs or executives or managers. They're just the proactive type. 10% are those who are going to be looking for the leader and roll up their sleeves and stand by your side and say, I'm going to come out there and I'm going to fight with you. 89% of people are not going to show any of those traits. And two things. One, it's okay. You're not going to get, I call turkeys and eagles, and neither one of those is enough. A tur you could search on context as king, by the way, turkeys and eagles. There's an article like that. Turkeys are not going to be eagles and vice versa. But if you could find a way to get the most out of everybody on your team, you are going to have so much more success. And that means also appreciating the people that may not be the most driven and the most kind of, you know, go-getter. Everybody plays a role. You cannot have 10 quarterbacks. You cannot have 10 strikers. And so for me, I would say seeing the good in everything, seeing the good in situations has served me well but also balancing that a little bit with a sense of reality that not everybody is like, you, and that's okay. Be a problem solver, create value. I, I wanna, do we have time to turn it over to some questions? You have a little bit of time left, Ash? Yeah, no, I'm good. Not going anywhere, we're in a pandemic. There's a lockdown. <laughs> Let's uh, let's turn it over to questions uh, from the audience. Guys, do you have any questions uh, for Ash here? Feel free to put them in the chat box. Or, or how, how do people usually do it, Jessica? Do they raise their hand and come up? You know, if you have a question, feel free to, to unmute yourself. Be respectful if you see somebody else that may be unmuted first. I think we're all adults. We know how this kind of kind of goes. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself uh, and, and go for it. After, after 12 months of pandemic Zooming, we should all have Zoom etiquette down by now. 
Yes. Well, I would, uh, so we got, oh, I see someone raise a hand, sorry. Uh, Michael, did you wanna ask something? Hope you're on mute, bud. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. I just wanna ask, ask Ash, how long have you been a CEO? I've been a CEO since January 1st, uh, 2006, so 15 years. That's a long time you've been leading. <laughs> Wow, okay, that's amazing. I just wanted to ask. It, it was very powerful words. I'm, I'm still thinking about a lot you said. Thank you. Thank and look, I'll be honest with you. You know, there was a saying, is, are leaders taught or are they born? I think everybody could be a CEO. I think technically, every, I, you know, here's what I, I've said to people. Anybody in theory can do anything, but they can't do everything, especially at once, right? So. I knew when I was younger that I probably didn't have the maturity yet or the confidence to be CEO. Um, and I was kind of like resisting that. But I also eventually learned to kind of embrace that and to kind of say, hey, maybe this is my destiny. And I really had a lot of success once I embraced that. And, and I know it sounds very much like I'm not talking Jedi talk here, but it was the same thing with being like a storyteller entrepreneur. Fundamentally, you got to bet on yourself. You know, and to everybody, you have to bet on yourself. This notion that somebody is going to walk through the door and give you an opportunity may be real. Like anybody here can email me. And if I could help you with Watch Mojo or through my network, it's easy. It's, it doesn't cost me anything. I love to do it. It's like I'm maniacal. Sometimes I'm like on LinkedIn at night and I'll just find somebody and I'll connect them to people. And I don't even, it's just, I like to do that. It's, it's kind of crazy. But I'm insane. Like most people are not like that, right? <laughs> most people are like, they, they, they got their problems. They're not waiting there to open doors for people and, and connect people. So you have to go for things yourself. You have to create opportunities for yourself. And did you, did you uh, acquire your skills as you develop in your leadership? Or did it just come to, because you, you said before, you cut yourself short you know, years ago, and you didn't really uh, put yourself, you open more doors. What you got with this organization, you felt the, you felt yourself grow the organization and you spent the will for this organization and you saw your, you saw your future there. Did you, did you uh, basically develop your, your, your leadership skills from there or did you just, it was just. Okay. So Fair question. The truth is, I feel I was always, uh, if I dare say so, like a great leader wanting to set by example. Doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. That's not what I'm getting. We, we all have flaws. We're all like imperfect. And some of it for me drives, it's a lot of drive and ambition, which my God, like that's, you know, it's, there's probably to unhealthy levels, but there was, despite the fact that I may come across as a very confident person, you do have to build up that confidence and you have to kind of go for it and be assertive, right? But I, I, I think the fundamental reality is as much as I grew up thinking I was John Smith, you know, like a white North American guy. Yeah, I think after 9-11, I kind of, you know, I was 22 at the time. I was just starting my career. You know, again, I'm, I'm atheist. I'm brought up here. It kind of hit me that I was a bit of an outsider. And then... You know, if you think of what's happened this year with, with the pandemic exacerbating this, you look at a couple of years ago, the Me Too movement, you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, and you kind of, you know, when all this was going on, I was kind of like, I did not want to pretend to wrap myself up in the flag that, that I never really fought for. Like, I wasn't out there putting up, like, hashtags and all. But in my own way, I was always an ally and supporting, and myself, I was an outsider and an underdog. And, and it kind of reinforced to me how much, whether it was a subconscious thing, whether it was an insecurity, it occurred to me that how much of my development had to do with basically being an outsider. And so this notion of leadership for me was something that I always demonstrated and manifested, but the same way that you have this prototypical image of a quarterback and for the longest time scouts I don't love sports by the way I love sports analogies 
for the longest time, scouts were like, well, you can't have a black quarterback. And I was like, well, why can't you have a black quarterback? It was this stereotype. I was constantly being overlooked for reasons that were BS and not necessarily rooted in racism, but it was like, well, Ash is too driven. Maybe Ash isn't loyal enough, even though I'm the most loyal person. And so for me, if I'm gonna give you an honest answer, I had to create all of this to be able to be in, the, this, in a situation where I could say, why aren't we giving this gal the job? Why are we all pretending to be for diversity, but the one group that applied for this like accelerator program that is led by a black entrepreneur, why are we not at least letting him go to the next round? Not saying he should make it all the way because he's black, but we're not even gonna let him go to the next round. It seems like something's off. And why in this room, nobody is speaking up to defend this visible minority or this. And so I kind of started to kind of process and go, oh, oh, I get it. I wasn't black. I wasn't Jewish. I wasn't a woman. I wasn't a member of the LGBTQ community. But in my own way, I felt like maybe I was a bit overlooked unfairly or discriminated. And, you know, America is obviously going through a little bit of reckoning with all these things. And now it's like Asian Americans that are speaking up rightfully. And there's going to be a day when the Muslims are going to come out and say, well, guess what? After 9-11, why were we thrown into the... So for me, I just realized that I had no choice. I had to go for it. Nobody was going to give me the puck, right? So I think a lot of it is nature. I had all these skills, but I was holding myself back. And eventually I had to kind of accept that and say, you know what? The world is unjust. Life is unfair. I can't sit here and feel pity for myself, nor, nor should I. I have a great life. But I said, I have to just make things happen for myself. And in business, that means you gotta be CEO, you gotta be the leader, you gotta go for it. And in my reality, Citibank wasn't gonna make me their CEO. Disney wasn't gonna make me their CEO. So I had to create my own world. And the essence I got out of that is, out of all these different things that's happening in America, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, it, it was basically self-driven what you wanna put your energy towards basically right it's like and all these different things going on and so the, I'm, I, I morally support this I morally support that but my self-driven energy is this direction as a leader well I mean no my comment about that was just there's two there's two nuances it was more that I, I realized that I was repressing whatever discrimination I had felt and it kind of realized to me, oh, this is why eventually I needed to go for it, become an entrepreneur, start a business. It wasn't that I kind of grew up and saying, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor because it's really cool. You got to be a doctor because you want to save lives, right? I realized that for me, I had to put myself in this situation because nobody was going to create it for me. The stuff with the Black Lives Matters, you know, LGBT community coming out a couple of years ago, Asians now, it's, I've said to my team, I'm like, guys, according to the census, I may be white, but I am a bit of an outsider. You are all mostly white. I'm all for any hashtag you want. I'll get the tattoos hashtag. I challenge you guys to go beyond the hashtags and act and follow through with your words and your actions every day. Because in meetings, in emails, I don't feel people really follow through. I don't want the hashtag, I want the action. If we're looking for candidates, why are there five white guys, let's say, not that that happens. So my comment with that was to say that I kind of hold people now to a higher standard to go, look, I don't pretend that I, go, I know what a black person goes through or a lesbian woman goes through and, and the discrimination that others feel, but I assure you that I've felt discrimination, but if you guys are all gonna come and wrap yourself under flags of the oppressed, that's not enough. You have to back the wall. You have to follow it with actions and deeds. And so I just look at it more like that, that it's a great day of reckoning, but let's now see it through 
and not just kind of rely on rhetoric, rhetoric alone. Okay. Gotcha. It's kind of it's kind of deep there. Very powerful stuff. Uh, we have time for one more, Ash. Sure. M Malcolm, do you want to ask something, bud? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Hey, how you doing, Ash? Group. Very good. 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 Um. I just want to know who were um, some of your inspirations, like who, who made the greatest impact in your Great life? question. Great, great question. I mean, look, so past and present too. Past and present. I mean, okay. The reality is when I was eight, my dad got, I remember the world book encyclopedia and I just developed this kind of like encyclopedia, like knowledge of everything and everyone in history. So I draw a lesson from the heroes and the villains because life, 80% of your success is what you don't do. It's what you don't say, frankly. So at the core, it's just lessons throughout history. You know, people assume like, oh, you must be interested in this person or that character because you write about them. But I'm like, no, I, I write about them because it's an interesting story. That said, obviously, to some extent, growing up, my dad, my mom, my older brother, siblings help you. I draw a lot of influence now from even people I work with. My spouse, Christine, we built the business together. She didn't really sign up to be um, an entrepreneur, you know, for the journey. She came for the ride. We have a great yin yang. It, it teaches me a lot. I think the best people, the best humans, are not those who kind of point to these false icons who are themselves flawed and superficially go, oh, this person was an influence. I humbly submit to you that my biggest influences are really more everyday people that I recognize have far bigger challenges, far bigger obstacles, and who still persevere and come out. And when I look at how well I have it, how every single problem, quotation marks for those who are just listening, are actually a factor of the good privilege that I've created, that gives me so much inspiration and so much perspective that then I can go out and do more good things to give back, create jobs, instead of kind of sitting there sulking about something that I don't like, which in the end, I'm like, okay, so like you scored three goals, made two assists, your team won six, one, you're complaining about that one goal your team gave up. So everybody influences me, everybody. Um, but it's more in the context of what they teach me and how it gives me better perspective. Great information. I appreciate that. Can can you give an example of a, of a let's say a particular situation that you know someone, your wife, for example, if you don't mind, um, no, not at all. A, a situation all. that may have happened that you drew some sort of uh, inspiration from. Sure. So when you are ambitious and when you start to have some success you do realize how much unfortunately some people are driven by envy and jealousy and those sins and the the things that are bad forces in life and when you are idealistic when you are driven you can let that get to you very quickly and you could get in a dark place and you could yourself then give into wrath and give into vengeance and want to do bad things as well. My wife is ultimately a, a reflection and a manifestation of another theme that I believe in, which is balance. So you, not just you, like one, one needs to appreciate how important balance is. And I call balance a, a journey to a destination you never arrive to because it's always, you know, it's like, it's, always, it's never really in equilibrium. So whenever I feel that I am 
about to lose perspective myself and overreact. My wife, because we're companions, we work together, we live together, we raise two kids together, has been basically from literally like the first day we met and went out, she's been that yin to the yang that explains why I haven't gone crazy. Like I'm not ever, I don't have suicidal thoughts, but I understand when some people get depressed. I understand why driven people are sometimes never happy. They're restless. People go like, well, why is Lady Gaga, let's say, depressed? She has all these hits. Well, because she has pressure. She wants to do better than she did before. She has a lot of people, right? So, so for me, that's an example of balance. It's an example of being able to just say, hey, let's calm down. Let's have some perspective. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, and I think ultimately balance is, is, is one of the, the key kind of lessons for you to find your course to success. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And, and on that note, it sounds like my better half is home. And so let's all give Ash one big more round of applause and thank you so much for being here with us tonight invaluable advice on on finding your purpose finding your balance being an entrepreneur giving back uh, uh, and creating value ash thank you again so much for being here thank you guys appreciate it